on what, what I call, what I use the Japanese term, rokusho yake. Yake is burning, and it's a disintegration of the silt chemically caused by this green pigment, mineral green, rokusho, uh, copper compound. And also blue may do it too, uh, azurite and malachite, uh, mineralogically. Anyway, I have an article on this. And this is the very painting that I was looking at with several students and with an old friend and colleague, Chinese, who, with whom I'd been carrying on an argument for years about what causes this disintegration. He was arguing that it was a yellow pigment. I think it was wrong, and in my website article, I quote scientists and give various uh, evidence for what really causes this. At any rate, it's a serious problem with numbers of Chinese painting. And in this case, it seems to have pretty much, uh, you know, finished, finished off this painting. Now here are two slides, uh, which we can put side by side, bringing it up closer. Uh, you can still see something of the landscape forms, the pine trees on the top of these, uh, of these rocky forms, and uh, buildings and figures and so on, a few, some of it. Yes, here in the one on the left, there are a few figures down below, and anyway. Um, well, as I say, it's almost too far gone to really talk about. But uh, you can see that the forms, the landscape masses, are of this blocky kind, as though he is showing them with uh, different surfaces uh, in different directions. And um, this is something that we saw back in Tang Dynasty landscape. And in fact, he is recreating not only the heavy color, but also something of the landscape style of the Tang Dynasty. And uh, somehow bringing back that blocky uh, rendering of landscape forms that gave them volume, which I showed in uh, details from Tang wall paintings. And the upper left here is a piece of writing, which is actually by the, supposed to be by, and maybe really by, the Emperor Gaozong. And in this uh, two four-character phrases, he makes a little imperial pun. He says, Li Tang ke bi, uh, Li Tang can be compared uh, Tang Li Sishun to Li Sishun of the Tang Dynasty. So in other words, Li Tang, turned around backwards, is Tang Li, Li of the Tang. Uh, let's say, a pun. But he's, uh, in fact, uh, as a matter of praise, uh, connecting his court artist, Li Tang, with the great master of the blue and green style, Li Sishun. So, okay, here it is. Here's the remains of an important painting, more to be talked about than to be looked at. Oh, here again is another slide of, uh, of actual uh, t scenery. And you can see in the lower section here and in some others that there is some basis for this blocky treatment of uh, landscape forms. In other words, the fracturing of the rock sometimes takes this form, and, uh, and it, it isn't pure imagination to paint, paint, the, um, paint the landscape in that way. Okay, now we go on to another painting. This is a quite, I think, quite wonderful uh, fan painting. I'll talk about fan paintings later, a very important subject in the Southern Song art. And uh, this one is in the Palace Museum in Taipei. And it actually has an old attribution to Yin Wan Gui, the early northern Sung artist, but that makes no sense. It isn't in that style. It's a meaningless attribution. In fact, it's very much in the style of Li Tang, as you can immediately see. I was the first one to what, recognize this and to publish it, and I published it in my Scarab book as a Li Tang style painting, as an, and, and an important painting in that sense. Now, several things, let's say several important things about it right off. First of all, it uh, shows this diagonally divided composition that becomes absolutely typical of Southern Song painting. And it seems to have originated around the time of Li Tong, maybe with Li Tong taking an important part in the, uh, in the popularity of it. If you draw a diagonal uh, line from the upper right to the lower left, most of the solid matter of the painting is going to be in the lower part uh, these uh, near closer uh, cliffs and pines and trees. And then the rest is uh, mist except for these peaks that rise out of it. Let me go on and say a little bit about the painting before, before looking into details. Um, paintings, as I say, associated with Li Tang, 
exemplify the idea of presenting scenic materials that arouse feelings. Uh, this is a new idea, not, not new at any rate in the late Northern Song, uh, very much re reflecting the preference of the Emperor Huizong, but also larger trends in the painting and landscape of the time. Um, paintings uh, that capture aspects of nature as it is perceived more fully than before. In other ways, it's, in other ways, it's a move away from naturalism. In other words, one can make arguments in both directions. Um, it, it's uh, away from attempts to represent the real world as it is understood in some intellectual way toward uh, more concentration on effect. Um, as in uh, Hui Zhong's uh, academy works, it's a matter of literary values being imposed on the pictorial, a kind of selected or idealized realism. As always, I'm using these words in a way that is rather unlike some realism or naturalism in Western art. So, but I've, I've done that throughout the series. So, okay. At any rate, this kind of painting runs through the Southern Sung, as I'll say, especially Southern Sung Academy painting, that is pictures of natural scenery that arouse certain more specific kinds of feelings about the world, about whatever. Oh, here's a, here's a slide I put in. Um, this is, here's a, a, a photograph of the artist Li Tong painting this picture. Well, not exactly. It's a bit later and it's a bit, uh, maybe a different place. It's Huangshan again. I took it on the top of Huangshan of a Chinese artist painting sketching, not painting, sketching the, what he sees in front of him. And I use it to make a point, which is that Chinese landscape painting is always studio painting, done in the studio. It isn't done out in nature. The idea of actually painting out in nature doesn't appear in China. I don't, I don't know when it does, but in the West, as you know, it's 19th century. It's Barbizon School in France and so on. Uh, but in in early times in China and also in, in in the rest of the world, the artist would make sketches in nature maybe, and then would put them together in the studio to make a painting. But the stu the final painting would be done in the studio. Now the an early Yuan artist named Huang Gong Wang, very famous and great artist, uh, has a set of uh, admonitions or advice for painters, uh, and among them is the idea that you should carry a sketchbook or paper uh, and a brush with you when you walk through nature. And when you see an interesting rock or tree or whatever, you make a sketch of it so you can use it later in your landscape. Well, that's what this painter is doing, this artist. He's making sketches that he will use in finished paintings. But the finished painting will always be done in uh, in the studio. And here, and okay, this is, ha ha, this is a painting. This is, I didn't take these slides with anything like this in mind, but I have a big, a big uh, collection of slides of Huangshan in Anhui province that are useful for showing that Li Tong's needle peaks with pines growing on them are not entirely matters of fantasy. Uh, these peaks exist, and the uh, the gazing beyond them into the uh, misty peaks rising beyond all that has some basis in reality. Or here is a slide of a close up of some rocky forms and uh, pine trees growing on them and mist beyond, which is a little bit like Li Tong. Okay, now let's go ahead and look at the de de details of this painting. Uh, here's one from the lower right. And you can see immediately several things that belong to the Li Tong style as we've already defined it. One is, of course, these two types of pine trees or whatever they are, uh, A and B, shall we call them anyway. Uh, very, very clearly distinguished here. Another is the ma uh, the nature of the contour lines, which have this kind of stepped uh, or almost zigzag uh, ver vertical, horizontal, vertical, and so on, as in the uh, the the, uh, the edges of the forms here in the lower right. Uh, these we'll see recurring in different ways throughout the um, the work of of of, of, Li, of Li Tong or uh, Li Tong followers, rather. Yes, just a minute. Uh, now here another one. Yeah, they, this is fairly damaged. Again, it may be from green color. Uh, here is another a closer look at the trees and some of the uh, some of the ma ma rocky mass. Well, we again, as in the hand scroll, we don't use big axe cut texture strokes in a small painting. They'd be much too prominent, and they wouldn't work. Uh, it has to be uh, subtler and 
lighter and so forth for a small painting. Next, please. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is another passage of the um, of the pines and the rocks with this characteristic contour and the large mass in the foreground with a bit sort of shadowy look on the left and certain texturing done just at the point where the light and shadow somehow intersect where texture actually is seen on forms. This is in other words just a visual effect. Okay, here another bit, here uh, another detail. Uh, the 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 mists beyond the tops of the mist are um, kind of decorative, but there must be some naturalistic referent behind them. And um, uh, anyway, okay. And here the uh, side of the uh, distant peaks, needle peaks with pines on top. I've shown slides that show these are not entirely made up. Anyway, a quite wonderful little leaf that is quite uh, well a poetic, evocative view of. Uh, pines and mist, uh, something very different from anything we've seen before. Before going on and leaving Li Tong, I'll put on briefly um, a painting of um, an autumn scene with a water buffalo and a herd boy. This is another subject that Li Tong is supposed to have done, and this could be his painting. It has a Li Tong signature, although it isn't really entirely convincing. This is in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. Maybe an early school work. At any rate, um, maybe the tree foliage may be, may be a little bit too repeated. I don't know. Anyway, uh, a fine painting. Um, the um, it, uh, the season autumn is captured by the uh, the uh, co the red color of the uh, leaves by the fact that some of the leaves are blowing off. Here, I'll show I'll show a uh, a minute a uh, detail of it of the lower part. Yeah, here we go. Um, red leaves blown off the 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 buffalo is uh, mooing or at any rate making the sound that water buffalo make. The boy is getting water, scooping up water to bring for the buffalo to drink. Uh, here is a close up of the water buffalo, quite beautifully drawn. Uh, it's uh, bridle hanging from its muzzle and on the ground, curled on the ground. Little details like this, and elsewhere strong drawing for the trees and so forth. Well, I'll talk about this kind of painting when I talk about one of Li Tong's uh, leading disciples, uh, Yen Tzu Ping, who also is famous for this kind of painting, and uh, uh, did a number of paintings that are attributed to him. Now, before leaving Li Tong, I'll put on and talk about briefly, and then bring back later, a pair of paintings, here they are, <clears throat> um, that are, have been uh, accepted by many as his work, which I think are impossible as his work. Okay, this is quite an interesting story. These are two paintings that are in Japan and were preserved in a temple. It's one of the temples within the Daitokuji, the great uh, uh, Chan temple to the Zen temple to the north of Kyoto. Northwest is a section of Kyoto. Um, the Koto Inn. And um, they were side pieces to a triptych the Japanese love to make triptychs and have a central figure painting. In this case, it was a religious painting attributed to Wu Daozi, crazily. And then on the sides, these two landscapes. Okay, um, they um, uh, two from a series of four seasons originally, but anyway, two surviving. Now, um, the one on the left here, you see uh, a, gr a group of leafy trees and then a branch projecting up above and uh, kind of a twig or branch putting, uh, pushing out to the right as though like a pointing finger. And then you can see a kind of blur. I don't have a detail of this. A kind of blur below that. Now that is actually a rubbed out would-be signature of Li Tang. And the great scholar Shimada Shujiro, once my teacher, I talked about him in the first lecture, Shimada discovered this uh, not only discovered this rubbed out signature, but managed to read it using infrared photography and found that it was a would-be signature of Li Tang. And immediately these paintings were accepted by most of the scholars of Japan and quite a few uh, uh, abroad as important works 